Well, hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. I am Ray, your most humble reviewer, and I'll be reviewing some recent and classic Lit RPG audiobooks for you today. I'm going to begin with Desire, a Lit RPG Adventure, Book 2, by Cameron Milan, narrated by John Downey, and it has a book length of 6 hours and 57 minutes. The Cult of Ra continued marching along the street. As they passed over the unconscious, charred body, they stomped down a little harder. Snap! The charred person was now a charred corpse. The faces of the cult were unperturbed, like they were stepping on an ant. Their eyes were glazed and hazy. Ahead of them, a figure appeared from around the corner. A massive greatsword hung over his shoulder as his arm lay lazily around the hilt. Guts casually walked towards the Cult of Ra, almost like he was unaware he was in a war zone. The tattoo of the sun was shining bright on one of the cultists. He was the leader of this group and a devout follower of Ra from the beginning. His eyes narrowed as he spotted the figure in front of him. He could feel a beastly aura emanating from Guts. He raised his hand and gave a command. Fire at will! A second later, a barrage of magic was sent towards Guts. He continued to walk as the missiles and bolts of magic blasted into his body. So, Desire is one of those books that at first glance, it, it seems to be fairly decent. But as you go deeper, you begin to notice some flaws. Nothing horrible, but kinks exist. I mean, first of all, Milan's dialogue is like something from an old Hanna-Barbera Saturday morning cartoon. The villain is very overly dramatic and very one-dimensional. Uh, he goes around challenging the heroes of the world, one, to prove his might, and two, to test his mettle, and three, so that he can kill them all, take over the world. Uh, it's just a basic generic villain that you get from every, you know, Thundar the Barbarian fought Gemini, and that was basically all Gemini wanted to do was just, you know, take over and do what he wanted to do there. So that's it. Generic villain, one, two, three. Uh, the plot itself is kind of convoluted. Uh, one of the heroes goes rogue in his own bid to take over the world. Uh, the heroes are very disjointed and have no clue of how to work together. And, and I mean, there's a couple that try, but even then, it's just, it's a mess. Uh, from start to finish, you can tell they are no Justice League or Avengers. Uh, they are pretty much individuals with their heads up their behinds on how to do things. It's just, it's just very confusing sometimes with what they do, why they do it, how they do things. Uh, they're not coordinated at all. That I can understand, being that they're from different countries and different backgrounds. But you would still think that um, when you have this alien uh, entity that's trying to destroy everything you hold dear, that you're going to kind of mesh together more and get, you know, become stronger together. And you don't really see that for most of the book. Now, there are also um, time jumps which kind of makes the pacing strange. I mean, it just, it goes all over the place. It, it's, it starts off in one place and ends up in a completely other, you know, time zone and uh, different planet. Uh, so you just have a hard time connecting with the characters uh, because they just jump around so much and they're very flat. I mean, really flat, one-dimensional characters when it comes right down to it. Uh, in the first book, I kind of let it slide when I was reading it because you, you just kind of have an idea that this is just supposed to be one of those fun superhero romps. But here, in book two, you kind of see that this is more of we really want to step up and try to be a serious, you know, superhero book. And with that, it just kind of just drops because before it was just, it was more fun. And then basically in this world, in Desire, uh, you get tattoos that give you abilities, powers. And I don't know if it's really ever explained. I, I can't remember. I mean, it's been so long since I read book one, um, why some people are stronger than others. Um, for example, there's one character who, who is Asian and he is powered by the more followers he has, which is great. It's kind of like Marvel's The Collective Man, who has like all the strength of all the people in China, if he so desires. But 
you have to ask, what was his power like when he first started out? He wouldn't have had any followers. He wouldn't have had any strength. He had no territories. So his power depended on followers and territories, neither of which he would have had when he started. So you have to say, really, in all honesty, how do you get from A to Z with, you know, that kind of a skill? You kind of have to do something to earn followers, and you have to do a lot to earn a territory and hold it. So it's one of those things where it works good on paper, but once you put it into practice, it just kind of goes wonky. Uh, so anyway, the story goes like this. And I, like I said, I'm, I don't want to sound frustrated with it, but there's just a lot of little things that just derail you as you go through the story. Um, an ancient super orc uh, warrior from another planet comes to Earth to kick butt, write down some names, and take over the planet. Unfortunately, the planet has defenders that he has to go through first, and they're not so easy, and he only gets to take one name before his pen breaks. Okay, uh, The book, which, while not overwhelming, stays on track up until the point that the uber-orc decides to team up with one of the human heroes to take over the world. Uh, really, this is just one of those things where they both know they're going to betray each other. Why even bother? They, they just should have either fought and killed each other and then tried to take over the world individually, uh, because at no point do they ever, ever, again, after that point when they agree to do this, uh, work together. It's just one of those things where they both say, I know you're going to betray me, and so, boom. Uh, it was just it was just weird. Uh, so it just kind of becomes a, a fight to beat the orc. And oops, the orc is actually stronger than we expected, or has some weird power manifest that allows him to escape and or beat the heroes before being chased off over and over and over again. It was one of those stories where you just kind of got tired of seeing him fight because no matter what the heroes threw at him, no matter what they did, suddenly some new power would manifest that he'd been holding back the entire time, uh, and he would either be able to escape or defeat them. Uh, it was less exciting than it was overly repetitive, uh, and it, just, it became more annoying the more it happened. I just wish that the heroes would have died and Earth would have exploded and the book would have been over at some point. It would have been much more exciting than the way things turned out. Uh, the story does have some cool uh, ideas, some core concepts, I think. Uh, for example, the people getting these powers from the magical tattoos. Each power seems to be unique to the individual as it grows, but not everybody develops high-tier abilities. Like I said before, the, the Asian hero Dragon gains his strength based on followers and territories and he has something along the lines of a million followers and he ends up using them to increase his stats for a temporary point which is great for him but it leaves his followers defenseless and the orc takes advantage of that believe me uh the orc on the other hand he seems to have no end to power reserves or abilities like i say every time he is almost beaten a new power pops up and he turns to tide this is like Saturday morning cartoon stuff, and it really came across to me like a fanfic combo of Dragon Ball Z and Justice League Unlimited. Uh, the orc went Super Saiyan more times than I could count, and to point to a point in fact that I didn't wonder if he was going to win or lose, I just had to ask what new power was going to show up that he hadn't used up until then. It was just a flat story. There were no surprises. Like I say, it just got to where I said, okay, how's he going to do this? What's going to occur now? How's he survive? And the only time that I actually felt connected to the characters or the tale was at the very, very end of the book. And there's a big planet fight by two of the heroes. Uh, what tried to be epic became a straight to the $5 bin at Walmart kind of story. Uh, the story just did not grab me the same way the original did. And I think I really only liked the original because... It was a, a, a neat new concept, and there was not like a, a, a Doctor Doomsian type villain or something that they could fight. It was like they were fighting monsters, and with the orc, it just kind of became repetitive and, and just derivative of every mustache twir twirling villain that you you've ever seen. Uh, the villains make or break a story, in my opinion. And the minute the orc shows up, he took deviled eggs. It made him into scrambled eggs somehow. I mean, he just, he ruined the whole thing from start to finish without, I don't know how he did it. I really don't. <sighs> now, the narration, it's a tough call. If you listen to the narrator, he has a lot of crazy stuff to, stay, to say. Uh, like the charred person became a charred corpse. 
Well, he was already a charred and dead, so nothing really changed from one second to the next, other than somebody stepped on the body and crunched it. Uh, it is the reading of his that comes off flat, but the flat reading can be almost excused for the silly lines that he has to say, either whether it's the dialogue or something like I just said with the, the foot crunching the dead body. Um, and I can remember listening to this story, but I literally have no memory of how he sounded. I had to go back and listen to him twice so that I could refresh my memory. Uh, so like I say, it was kind of like he bleached himself right from my mind afterwards. It, he's not a bad narrator overall. I mean, I think he's clear and he's understandable, but there was very little emotion to what he said. Uh, but there was no animus to any any of his characters, none, or, or the reading. And, and this just, it, this really felt like he just said, well, uh, I'm going to have to slog through this, so I might as well make the best of it, which he tried to. Now, sadly, I have no other series to compare him to, uh, because I haven't heard anything else that he's done. So I can't say, well, it was just the material that kind of st stopped him here. I don't know that. I, I just know that sometimes, like, like I, I will say right now, first and foremost, um, that Matthew Broadhead, um, from the bathrobe night, he, he can, I think that's his name was Matthew Broad, but Broadhead, uh, he'll either sink or swim by the story. I mean, a great story elevates him up. Like next week I'll do a review of the merchant of Tikba, which I really liked. Um, and Matthew, he, he did that book, but the last two books that I've, I've reviewed that he did, I didn't think he was amazing. I, I think he just kind of was, yeah. And so, like I say, with, with Broadhead, it, it really comes down to material. Here, I just don't know if it's material or just mediocrity at its best. And I hate to say it like that, but I wasn't overly impressed with this, the way it was read. Uh, I just don't know how to say it any other way and be honest with you. So, I'd like to say it was a memorable performance, but the only thing I can truly recall was that he sounded like he was mostly bored uh final score i'm gonna give this a 6.9 the book jumps all over the place and the one saving grace that i was happy to see is that the book was not afraid to kill off characters to me that's a huge huge thing i don't think that every character needs to die it's not game of thrones george rr R. martin type stuff for every single story but i think that in order to have some gravity and, and some depth to a situation you have to kill characters periodically uh a lot of times characters death will equate to growth in other characters whether you know they, they learn something or there's an emotional stirring in them that will inspire other characters in books to do things that they wouldn't normally do. Here, as much as I like to say, well, they did kill characters. Yeah, they killed characters. But I didn't see a lot of growth or change come from the deaths. I mean, honestly, uh, the first person who died, I can't even think of her name, uh, but she was the cold uh, manipulator. Her death was absolutely meaningless to the other characters in the story, other than the fact that she had died, and it was like, oh no, she's been killed? What will we do? So, you know, that was the one saving grace, but it didn't really do a lot for the book otherwise. Uh, the combo, you know, dialogue and characters, just, it, it tanked the, the whole story and it just kind of got into a middle ground kind of area. So I didn't hate the book, but I didn't embrace it. And the narration did not help. Usually, you know, a good narrator will lift up a story, will hear... It, he just kind of kept it right where it was at. It was just a straight across playing field that was level. And I just didn't get a whole heck of a lot out of it. So 6.9, as much as I hate to do that, I just didn't think it was magical. And I think there were a lot of issues with the story, especially just like I say, dialogue, uh, character development. It just, it just kind of all ran together. It was just a big mess. So 6.9 for Desire. Hopefully next time around, it'll be a little bit better. So next up, my sound booth spotlight for the week is the Wayward Bard, World of Change, book one. Did I say change? World of Chains. I hope that's clearer now. By Lars M. Mm, Lars M. Hmm. Narrated by Justin Thomas James, Jeff Hayes, and Lori Catherine Winkle. 
The book's length is 12 hours and 45 minutes. You have died. You can either wait for resurrection or respawn at your respawn point. Warning. Respawning can result in negative effects to your items and stats or loss of items. Wait or respawn. Respawn. Jeez. Congratulations. You have learned a new skill. Concentration. Concentration helps you ignore distractions and even pain at will in order to complete what you are working on. Every skill point in concentration will increase the likelihood that you are not interrupted. Stat. Endurance. Gah, yeah. Fat lot of good that did me. Furious with the difficulty of it all and my myriad of bad decisions, I was entirely unsure what to do now. And, to add insult to injury, I could see that my shoes had stayed with my corpse. A short while later, I parked my sorry ass right outside of the chamber of the kobold guard and tried to come up with a better strategy. Of course, I could try, again and again. If I hit a critical hit with one of my spells, I was pretty sure I could take him down. All right, so gather around the fire, kitties, because here is the tale you have been waiting for. This is my sound booth spotlight for the week, and I have been trying to get this on the show for a while now. Other books just kept jumping ahead of it for various reasons, but I am finally able to let you know how awesome this book really is. Ready? I'm going to start off chatting about the sound booth theater. I can't talk. The sound booth theater and how they handled this amazing book. You know, one thing that I really respect about Jeff Hayes is his vision. He does not want to just crank out reading of, readings of books. Uh, he wants you to have an auditory experience, okay? Uh, that's why if you listen to like something like Harmon Cooper's amazing Cherry Blossom Girls, uh, you, you practically get the entire cast of Sound Booth Theater, plus sound effects. And I sort of griped, and I, I'll admit, I gripe a lot that there are so many readers in those books because I really prefer one voice over multiple people talking. I, I think that one person can tell a tale and do it well. Maybe I would say, you know, hey, great, you got like a bunch of female characters, so bring in a, a female narrator to help out. I can live with that, but three or four, and it becomes a radio show program, you know, from the 40s, which I used to love. I still listen to, you know, I, I have all those Johnny Dollar, you know, uh, recordings and, and the shadow and that sort of thing. Uh, I am a huge old time radio buff. Uh, and that's why I like audiobooks so much, but I don't like my audiobooks to sound like OTR programs, but dang, if Jeff doesn't know how to make things happen, uh, he's up the game so far ahead. He's converted my way of thinking. And, and I say this because I know it's Jeff's vision. And it's been Jeff's vision since day one uh, that, you know, that I first heard him talking about this a long time ago. So the way we're barred is less of an experience than it is a full on event. It has multiple narrators, sound effects and music. And believe me, it's one of those things that once it occurs, you wonder why the hell haven't they been doing this forever? Honestly, honestly. And that's why I can't wait for Harmon Cooper's, you know, uh, Monster Hunters to come out where they actually have uh, original music because that is really cool. This here has awesome, you know, violin music, but I want to hear the original stuff. Justin Thomas James sings. <laughs> I mean, this does a lot of stuff <clears throat> and it's impressive the whole way through. Okay. So I I I'll say it like this. Justin Thomas James God, you're awesome, dude. Uh, he carries this book like he is Atlas holding up the world. He shrugs his shoulders and the world moves. The man has a smooth, mellow voice that just draws you in. You can't help but listen to him. His is the voice that I want on loudspeakers during the apocalypse saying, Please remain calm. There is nothing you can do to stop the end of the world. But you don't have to go out in a panic. Please enjoy the time that you have remaining left. After hearing him say something like that, 
I think I would just opt to chill out and watch the world burn. He's got that kind of a voice. Seriously. Uh, <laughs> I mean, seriously. James is one of my faves. And it has been it has been that way since I first listened to him in Afterlife Reboot by Domino Finn. JTJ, the man with three first names, has a range of voices that you don't expect from a fellow with such a sonorous sonorous or sonorous sonorous he's not snoring uh sonorous vocal style jeff hayes role plays in to play a punny little character or two and i mean that's very punny uh and the bonnie to james clyde Lori catherine winkle stops in to steal a scene or two as a matronly tinker or shopkeeper uh she really i love hearing her come in no matter what she's doing um, she's just awesome um so, you know, and she and, and, and Justin work so well together. Uh, they are a very good pairing. And like, did I mention that Justin Thomas James sings? Yep, yep, yep. I think I did. You really don't want to miss this book. Now, I have to admit, <coughs> excuse me, I'm still fighting a bit of a cold here. When the music first rolled in, I had a little trouble hearing Justin speaking, but that is my crappy ears and not production issues from SBT. I did not have a problem like that again for the rest of the book. And SBT really turned things up to 11 here. I mean, they went full on, you know, um, sound blast and mind blowing experiences that you just don't get with other audiobooks. I, I seriously, I think this is the only contender that I'll be able to, you know, give my honorary award for the most audacious auditory attempt of 2018. And that might be just because the Harmon Cooper book won't be out before the end of the year. Uh, but either way, there's no losers. There's no losers. No one loses. This is a kind of an event, especially the readers or listeners. So now that I've done all this blibber blabbering blabber about, you know, SBT and how great everybody is there, let me tell you about Lars M. Here's a guy, as John Madden would say, who knows how to write. Not only does he craft a great story, but he starts off with one hell of a good reason to get into a game long term. I don't have a football thing to, to go back to, so sorry. He does make the game very interesting enough that you're glad that he's going to be in the game for a year or two. He not only scripts perfect prose, but he cr also cranks out some decent songs for Justin Thomas James to sing. The story is basically about a dude who rips off the Russian mob and opts to go underground for about two years by hiding in a virtual game called World of Chains. He hopes to do two things. Let the heat die down while he's in the game, and then sit back and play some music, drink some brew, and dally with the ladies. In game, of course. Naturally... Something goes wrong, and all of his plans go out the window moments after he arrives in the game. He reluctantly becomes a hero. He really does not want to. He wants to be a guy that just hangs out at the bar and just drinks beer all day. Uh, and that's where, you know, he, he sets off to become a real bard. From there, a mystery intertwines with the adventure, and the story takes off. I like the reluctant hero bit a lot. It works well with most stories, especially here. Uh, and I am glad to finally get what I've been waiting for for a while now. A good bard novel. Okay, I've been waiting for a good bard novel for so long. So long. And finally, it's here. My only complaint, I wanted to see just a little seduction being pulled off. And I don't count charm monster spells being used because no one wants to kiss a Medusa or something. Okay, now I will admit this is not an action-packed go kill 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 type of book. Uh, the this is a bard's tale after all, and everybody knows that bards are not front-line tankers. Okay, that's just the way it is. Uh, they are more like boom boxes. You guys even remember what boom boxes are uh, that fire arrows or spells? I did miss seeing the bard placed into a group dynamic. I mean, he does have, like, you know, some people he hangs out with. He's got one fellow that he does a lot of dungeon delving with. But I really, really wanted to see him interact in a big, full party and see what he could do as a bard. Uh, that would have been just, just amazing to see. So, like, maybe a little bit more seduction next book around Lars, or maybe a bigger group for him to play with to see how his music could affect the entire group. Would have been really nice, and I, I, I really anticipate that happening. Uh, 
I would have liked to see the Bard enhance, bolster, or empower group through his music. But either way, the story is fun, 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 and it it, it wasn't hard. It wasn't a, how do I say this? It wasn't one of those books where you see who it was that was causing the mystery, who was doing the bad stuff. I mean, it's not laid out pretty clearly. Uh, I'm sure that the clues are there for you to look at. But if you're just listening along and you're going through it, it's not obvious. And that made it nice. You had to actually think things through. Usually I can pick out like who the villain is in about four seconds. Um, but he did a pretty good job of wrapping them up in a veil and, and, you know, keeping it to the back. So, you know, it wasn't like one of those ones where you just say, I knew who it was the whole time. It, it really was a nice surprise. <sighs> so from start to finish, Master M. Now, I only wonder now if... The M stands for Moriarty. Hmm. Well, Lars M weaves a nice slow build mystery with some puzzles and monsters to overcome. Lars Machmuller, you're an excellent author, and I really appreciate the story that you gave me because I've been needing a good bard tale for some time now. The work by SBT will just blow your ears away as well as your mind. So I have to pass out 8.5 stars for the combo of the production and writing. So congrats to, to Lars Machmuller and the Sambu Theater for an amazing experience. Uh, this is something I look forward to, you know, the next book around, because this was a fun little experience. I just want more now. I want to see, you know, the MC seducing some chicks trying to be non-PC here. He's, he's hitting the babes with his music, and I want to see a group dynamic. I want to see him go out there and juice up the party with his power and get some things done that, you know, we don't usually get to see from other characters, like, you know, clerics or mages or anything like that. Bards are very special. They're near and dear to my heart, because if I had to pick a character class that I was going to exist as... That would be it. That would be who I was. Believe me. I'd be a halfling bard in a heartbeat. Because halflings know how to enjoy life. Mm -hmm. And bards, well, they just do it better. Anyway, uh, that's my score for this, this, uh, this book. It was really fun and enjoyable. I'm sure you will like it. So 8.5 stars. Go and read it or listen. Thank you. Well, 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 the next book I'm doing is Regicide, The Completionist Chronicles, Book 2 by Dakota Kraut, narrated by Vicus Adams with a book length of 13 hours and 3 minutes. ...of an abuse of power makes me hesitant to accept this course of action, unless perhaps you have a guild that you would recommend right away, a trial run... The queen's head tilted a bit as she gazed at her most trusted advisor. The general looked at his apprentice with a grin, and Tiona, guild officer of the Wanderer's Guild, smiled right back at him. I may already have a group in mind, your majesty. Chapter 1 Joe flinched as a knock boomed against the door to his warehouse. It had been just under a week since his altercation with the Mage's College, and so far no one had anything negative to say about it. Deep down, though, he knew that when someone is raised as a fanatic and another person shatters their worldview, well, history doesn't show that person living a long and happy life. In short, Joe was sure that someone was eventually going to come after him. So the great bald chronicler of all things occult has returned, and the world is much better for it. Again, I curse Dakota Kraut for putting out such excellence instead of the Divine Dungeon, at least on Audible, because Divine Dungeon 4 just came out in paperback or uh, Kindle form or ebook or whatever you want to call it. Hasn't hit the audio waves yet, so it's dragging out for me. I just I need the book now. Um, it irks me that he's created yet another series so addictive that I had to create an actual ritual that signaled I was ready to start reading the book before I sat down to listen every time I did. Okay, I exaggerate a little bit. I don't do rituals, but I always, always 
here that if you had to pick one game world, which one would it be? And I thought about this for a while. I mean, there are some that, like books that I love, like say Delvers, for example. Delvers, I love the books, but I would not want to live on Ludus. No. Uh, love War Eternus, would not want to live on that game world. No. No. So, the more and more that I think about it, I realized I would have chosen Kraut's setting for the Completionist Chronicles. There are tons of options for your characters based on class or race. Everything is boosted by your real-life skills, so a chiropractor becomes a fearsome warrior based on his knowledge of anatomy, pressure points, and nerve clusters. And I really have to wonder, what would I be able to do as a funeral director? You know, where would I be able to, you know, maybe I, I can aspirate somebody with a sword. You know, uh, that sort of thing. I don't know, but I'd be curious to see what I could do as a funeral director in that world. Uh, now, Joe, the main character, uh, he decides to start up his own little group since he's really kind of been abandoned by the group he worked with in the first book. And so he sort of dirty dozens the hell out of potential guild members who were turned down because of their odd proclivities. Each person that he handpicks for his personal squad is an oddball in some bizarre way. But they're all very interesting and unique characters, and for a ragtag squad of weirdos, they work really well together as a team. I think that my my favorite way that Kraut worked out the attribute charm in the game was just amazing. Um, <laughs> there is a really, really awesome uh, sequence regarding that attribute uh, for one of the characters. Uh, it's funny, and it makes a lot of sense, and I believe... It works to such a level because it's clever what he does with it. It's so clever. And you've never seen this done in a, in a gaming book before, whether it's game lit, lit RPG. Never seen it done, but now I can see other people stealing this concept and running with it because it's brilliant. Just brilliant. Um, it, you know, so the consequences of having a low score for charm uh, or charisma, however, you want, however it was, it's just, it's hilarious. Uh, for me, that was the best part of the story. It was a small, almost throwaway bit, but it worked so well and had such an impact on our favorite cracker backer that it just kind of stood out like a firework in a coal mine. I just, I, I just thought it was great. So, anyway, I also appreciated how nothing in the game is just given over. Joe has to work to be able to learn. For example, just how to create a scroll. He's got to struggle to be able to create ink and write with a pen and work with the right paper. Uh, so it's not like he just goes and grabs stuff and goes and he's able to do it right away. He's actually got to put some work in and learn and, you know, do what he can to achieve his goals. So there's nothing just handed over to anybody in the game. There were a few things that I was not a fan of. Uh, for example, the town that became a dungeon sequence did not fly well with me. Uh, I don't know if it was because of the constant failures the group encountered or just the format of the story. But, you know, you know if you remember when I talk about um, Apathy Online, you know, the, the Bagwell series where they go off and they, they deal with the, uh, the hippie and, and that sort of thing. And in the book before that, preceding Apathy Online, the side quest, they have the hippie trials. And to me, the hippie trials was just, it was grating and it just, just sucked the life out of me. And here, the, the town that became a dungeon for a little while, it didn't have that same property, but I did not love it. I, you know, just something about it was just off to me and it just kind of, I don't know. It was the only part of the book I had a hard time getting through. It was just very clunky with Barry, a pun that was fun and that made me have to grip my teeth and bear it through most of the bare bones of the battles. Uh, it was just the only one, I, like I say, the only part of the book I had a hard time getting through. It just kind of stalled there for some reason. Now, one of my favorite sequences involved Joe creating an artifact level building, which was really fun, even though there was no fighting involved. I would have enjoyed more research or meeting up with the fellow who sold him his brains in the first book. That looked like an interesting path, but Dakota did not follow it this time around. I think there were several things that were kind of uh, breadcrumb throughout the first book that we didn't follow up on in the second. And hopefully those were just kind of ignored 
because just because we're going to come back to those at some point. Uh, but like I say, the guy that was selling brains, uh, who had suspicions about Joe, that was a really interesting, you know, character and a take on, you know, the stories. And we just didn't get back to it. I'd like to see that happen again. So, you know, it is what it is. Several developments that were also enjoyable was we get to see a little bit more of Joe's mother and that not everything in the guild is apples and rainbows. It's more like a-holes and raisins. Uh, there's a lot of strife that leads to a great confrontation. And Joe do does some things you just don't expect. Oh, and by the title of the book, you just might be misled into thinking what the actual name of the book is about. It's a little misleading. Just a little bit. And you'll get the title at the end of the book, though. Believe me. Uh, now, Vicus Adams. You know, the man is a narrator. He continues to please, amaze, and astound. I think that he works so well with Kraut that they're pretty much an unbeatable team. And I honestly, at this point, I don't know if I would even want to, you know, hear anybody else do Kraut's books. You know, one of the things I appreciate with James Hunter is that he, he feels that his series has to maintain, you know, a cohesive sound. So, you know, with him, Ar Armin Taylor does his VGO book series. Uh, but the other books that are coming out will be done by other narrators. It won't be Armin doing all of the books all of the time, all the way through. They'll be given different voices. And I think that's really a wise way of doing things. Whereas here, just Adams and Kraut really mesh well. Adams' voice is so versatile, and it's able to run a range of emotions and carries depths that he elevates the book to a whole new level. I really enjoy listening to him. And like I say, he really reminds me a lot of Jeff Hayes, with his vocal range for females, I think he's probably the only narrator who I think can do female voices as well as Jeff. Now, he doesn't do, you know, as many female voices as Jeff does, but he's pretty, pretty good at what he does. And, and I just think that, you know, he, he nails that down with whatever book he is doing. Uh, characters, emotions, you know, pacing, plot. He hits every nail on the head as he goes. There's never a question of, you know, is he doing this the right way? He is doing everything properly. <coughs> so I'm going to give this book an 8.4 rating. I enjoyed it, but I felt that the dungeon sequence did not fit well with the rest of the book. Um, it just felt like he needed something to let the team fight together against. And it just didn't click like it did the other areas of the book. And, and I think that was what it was. It was like there was a group dynamic that he wanted to have happen. But it just, for some reason, there was no turning of the lock, you know, the key in the lock to make things happen. It just didn't do what it was supposed to do. And because of that, it just kind of fell flat for me. And I hate to say that because I really think the book is just, it's utterly brilliant. Uh, there were some scenes that I just think, uh, you know, were smart, you know, I, I love seeing Joe steal, you know, uh, different kind of altars from other gods. Uh, <laughs> that was really fun watching him do that. And he did it with just such callousness. It was just like, oh, should I do this? Yes, 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 I shall. I shall take this and claim it as my own. Never thought for the god who had it, never. Uh, and it was just, it was just funny the way he worked that out. Um, so there were like a lot of great things and I really enjoyed it. It was another fantastic job, great stuff. But like I say, the dungeon sequence just didn't click and I didn't like the bear stuff uh, that was there. That was just kind of like, and it was odd. It took me away. So, you know, 8.4, it's still a fantastic book. It's an amazing read. Uh, and like I say, that's the only issue I have is just basically it just had one little bad sequence to it. In my opinion, there are other people out there that may love that sequence and that's great power to them. Uh, but for me, it just didn't click and didn't work. So still 8.4. It's great. You will love this book. If you like divine dungeon or the first completionist chronicles, this book will take your breath away. Well, welcome <clears throat> to my first ever. Is it, Game lit or lit RPG sequence. 
Uh, today, I'm going to start off this series of little uh, examinations of different books from different genres uh, and looking to see, do they actually fit the classic mold of lit RPG? Uh, some people have told me this book that I'm going to review is one of those books. Uh, I will see. I will let you know what I think about it as a lit RPG book and as a book unto its own merits. Uh, so today I'm going to start off <clears throat> this entire sequence with Yesterday's Space Mage by Timothy Ellis, narrated by Kevin T. Collins, and with a book length of 7 hours and 19 minutes. No one wants to train them. These boys leave the town and rarely ever come back. I had no worries on this count, though. I'm serious and withdrawn until you get to know me, and when you do, you get the full force of my sense of humor. This isn't necessarily a good thing, since a very serious master hates having a wise-cracking boy to train, but all the same, I don't consider myself a wisecracker. I'm not even sure I'm funny, although people do laugh. But I digress. Arriving at the town hall means meeting and greeting everyone, thankfully informally. A quick handshake with those offering hands, nods to others, and the inevitable hugs from elderly female relatives. At the appointed hour, you stand in the center of the master's circle, facing the mayor, and they all decide your fate, while making you think it's actually your choice. <clears throat> all right. So this was a tough one for me. First of all, I had so many suggestions that this was one of the first books I should try. Uh, that this, they, they, People would tell me this feels like a lit RPG. So do you think it could be lit? You know, could we add this into our little, you know, click, you know, and, and get this book out there? And, and I'll get to that at the end when I think about that. But the truth is, this is a book that was kind of weirdly broken into different sections. I had a lot of trouble with how it ended and a couple other things. Now, first, the odd stuff. The book's premise, and I'll get into that in a second here, but I want to give you an idea of what the book's about. There is a young man named Thorne. Uh, Thorne is raised in a society in which you can detail what job you want during a coming-of-age ceremony. You are offered numerous jobs, depending on how skilled you are, and you've gone to a school, and they say, okay... We know he's good for here, and he's good for here, and he's good for here. So you may work your way all the way up the ladder. You can stop at any point and say, okay, I just I want to make sure I'm safe. I'm going to pick this area right here. Uh, and it goes from, like, just say, like a janitor all the way up to battle mage. That's like the best thing ever is the battle mage. Uh, and Thorne is one of these people that he, it's odd in that he knows he did a lot of things really well, but he doesn't really have a clue as to how good he was, and which is odd because I think you would know, you know, like, oh man, I just killed that examination. Man, that test was so easy. Ah, oh, I just, I aced this. I, I knew this backwards and forwards. There's none of that. Um, Thorne really has no clue uh, as to what his skill or abilities really are. Uh, so. He has this whole thing where he has to go through this job profile. Uh, and it's his life job. And I'm guessing that once you pick something with it, you're stuck. Uh, there's no take backsies or something along those lines. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> it turns out he wants to be a battle mage. The toughest job to get. And the High Lord Emperor or King or whoever uh, is the only other person who's ever gotten to that rank that he's he's... Actually, he makes it to. I won't say it's a spoiler because it's in the first chapter. Uh, he actually is the only person to ever get to that point after the the king or the emperor, whoever it was. Um, so the king or the emperor kind of says, you know, either you're going to work for me or you're going to die. And the boy kind of decides that he's going to nope out of the whole situation by telling a port away. And as he tries to teleport away, he is attacked. Uh, and he shunts off all the various energies that are coming at him and uses them to aid his teleportation. Well, he gets a little bit more than he bargained for, and he wakes up in the future. Uh, after a bit of time, he, he realizes that there's no magic in the world anymore, uh, but he does manage to regain his abilities once he re... Uh, 
examines how magic works. He, he kind of puts himself out of the paradigm of the old world because he realizes he's gone so far into the future that uh, <clears throat> it's like yin yang. They've reached a point where it's a low power and he changes, you know, drawing from positive energies to let's just say negative energies. It works the same. He just reverses what he was doing before, however you want to look at it. Uh, but that's basically it. So he's in the future and he's kind of getting his footing. He, he lives as basically a foster child for a little bit of time cared for by the States. Uh, once he's old enough, he kind of just teleports away. And the first thing he does once he, he does that is he goes to a mountainside and he meets aliens who kidnap him. So after he kind of has his little scuffle with the aliens, he kills them all. Uh, he ends up stuck in outer space, no idea how to get back home or where his home is, and he just kind of goes on a spree of attacking slavers and maybe rescuing a few people along the way. So, what are some of the odd things about the book? Well, that you are literally given no information about who his people were, where they're from, where he ends up in the future, who the aliens are that kidnap him, or even who the military is that he fights against. It's just really bizarre that you don't get like a name, uh, you know, or anything along those lines for any of those things. Nothing other than like the king gets a name or, you know, some of the, the, the advisors. But you don't have any clues about any of that stuff. It's just it's bizarre. Um, there shouldn't be anything kept from the reader for any reason unless it's to reveal something later on here. The things that are held back or not, not forthcoming really have no bearing on any parts of the story other than the fact that they just weren't mentioned. And it's weird. Uh, I don't know. It just, you know, it just, it was one of those things that just really struck me as odd. Secondly, as I said in the beginning, each part of the book feels like a story unto itself, with the beginning being the most interesting. I really liked the job selection that was going on and how he defended himself uh, against the other mages who were much more experienced than him. I mean, you got to remember, he's a student who really thinks he doesn't know jack about the magic that he's working with. And the people that come after him are all the, the, the underlings of the king or the emperor himself, as well as the emperor. And he's able to hold off all of them by himself. All of them. So he's pretty talented. He's pretty talented. Um, and I don't know. Each, each part kind of deals, you know, each section deals with the MC sort of finding his way and where he belongs. Like in the first one, he finds out he's really awesome at being, you know, the battle mage, but he doesn't belong there. And he ends up going, you know, into the future. In the future, he kind of feels like he doesn't belong there and he has to struggle to get his magic. And in the third section, he knows how to use his magic. He actually belongs in space. But uh, he doesn't stay there. It, it's it, the ending is so so frustrating, so frustrating. And it might be you know set up for a, a second book, but it, it was just really I don't know. I just don't understand why that the book went that route. Um, I don't want to give anything away, but everything he does do at the very end was so out of character, and it just did not fit the rest of the story. Here's a guy who wanted to be a battle mage. And when that opportunity comes that he's able to transform himself not only into a battle mage, but a space battle mage, he turns away from it. It felt, felt forced and to me it was not organic at all. Now, Kevin T. Collins' narration is a standout. He's probably not someone you would know since he's not part of the lit RPG community, but he really handles the story well and peppers it with emotion and really hands out defined personalities to each character. He does do voices for each character as well, and I like listening to him. I don't think he does women's voices uh, amazingly. I think he does them okay. But, I mean, overall, I mean, he does a really nice job. I had fun with him uh, telling me the story. Uh, he he does have a unique cadence. And, and listen to, go back and listen to the, the clip that we play of this because it's such a unique cadence. It, he just has a way of talking uh, that 
the storytelling kind of it, it's like listening to somebody speak an iambic pentameter it, it, you just, just kind of get gripped by it uh like i said i just kind of enjoyed it as it went it was like a nice little flow it was like a, and i hate jazz so i'm gonna just say it, it was like a jazz riff just kind of going off on its own don't like jazz music but that's neither here nor there but it, it stands out it really stands out the way he does his readings and i appreciated the fine work that he did so now the question becomes, is this close to lit RPG? I really got to say no. In spite of the, a lot of people telling me that this book felt like a lit RPG book, there are certain criteria that have to be met, and in no way does this even come close. The main character does not level up. He's pretty much as powerful at the end as he is at the beginning. He just kind of streamlines how he uses his powers. Uh, there are no stats, no correlation to stats or attributes, nothing along those lines at all. I think the closest thing we get to even coming into like a game lit would be him using a portal where he actually jumps from the past into the present or the future, however you want to look at it. Uh, the time jumps, he does technically enter a new world. But it's still his old world, and he never gets near, you know, a game or a game type world at all. So, you know, I just can't call this even close to being game lit. Uh, there are others that I could almost make arguments about without even really having to fight with it. This one here, I, I would really like to, to have the people that told me this uh, was game lit or lit RPG show me why they think it was, because to me, it, it's it's not a bad story. Uh, it just does not take a slot in the little RPG book, uh, you know, universe. Uh, the story is good and the character is interesting. I enjoyed the book, but the ending really let me down so much. I wanted so much more for Thor. So I'm going to give this 7.5 stars. It's a decent read, but... In no way does it become close to being lit RPG, and that has no effect on my score. My score just comes from the fact that there's a lot of information that we just we just never see, and the ending is just so bizarre. Like I can't understand why Thor would do what he did, unless there's like a massive, massive shift in the next book that would explain it. But as it is right now, it was just a bizarre ending, and it was not a happy ending uh, because it was just such a downer for no reason. I can take sad endings as long as there's a point to it. Here, it was just kind of like, yeah, I don't know what's going on. So 7.5 stars. It's a good book. It's a good lesson. Um, but it didn't knock my socks off, and it's definitely not lit RPG, guys. Sorry. Maybe my next book will be. We'll see. So, if you like this idea, give me a, you know, a mention down below. Uh, or if you have an idea for another type of show, I'm going to still do the Is It Lit? Uh, but I can do other things as well. I can interchange each week. So, thank you all, and we will see you next time. Well, that's this week's show, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate you taking the time to watch or listen. Uh, and if you want to support us, I would ask you please like the Lit RPG Podcast Facebook page or the YouTube page, or just share and like the video. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube. And as I always say, please, please, please leave comments down below. Uh, suggestions for the show is deeply appreciate it. I really do appreciate getting some suggestions for something else we can do. Uh, we did the dungeon special and as you can see in this episode I have started doing a Is It Lit RPG uh, section. So uh, any suggestions for that? I've got probably 10 books right now so for the next 10 weeks I'm rock solid on Is It Lit RPG or not or Game Lit and we can go from there. So any suggestions in that, that category or other categories of books that you'd like to see, let me know. Uh, so for the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast, I'm Ray. Keep listening.